So my name is Bree. I'm part of the co coordinating committee uh, of Kairos here in the local Kairos. Um, there's a number of folks who put a lot of effort in uh, to tonight and I just sort of jumped on board. So uh, I just wanna highlight the work of those folks. Um, yeah, and welcome everyone here to this really, uh, really important topic. And uh, yeah, I'm so grateful for those who are coming and sharing today for several points who's here. So thanks so much. Um, yeah, it's really important that we, uh, we talk about uh, the land that we're in and, and we're gonna talk a lot about Brandon tonight. Um, and a lot of us here are from Winnipeg and from other places. Uh, so just, uh, it's always super important to acknowledge um, the land that we're on. And this gathering is, is centered in uh, Treaty 1 and Treaty 2 territories, which are the ancestral lands of the Dakota, Nakota, Anishinaabe, Salto Ojibwe and Cree nations, as well as the homeland of the Métis nation. Um, and it's also important to acknowledge that our energy comes from treaties three and five. Um, and that there's participants here tonight who are uh, from a whole bunch of places also. So uh, we're grateful and we welcome. Um, yeah, we're so happy to have everyone here. Great, thanks, Linda. Um, yeah, I really love to see everyone in the chat. So uh, I'd like to pass it off to Debbie for, uh, for uh, the offering of tobacco and introducing our elder. Thanks, Bree, and uh, welcome to your new position. I, um, I just want to introduce our uh, honorary elder for our series, uh, Marge Rosselli, who is a respected elder from Sioux Valley Dakota Nation. Um, and she uh, agreed to uh, be our elder for this series. And if anyone finds uh, any of the presentations to be stressful or triggering or difficult, um, I would encourage you just to contact Marge in the chat box and um, she will offer support in whatever way is appropriate. I'd also like to uh, present virtually um, Marge with tobacco and we present this with thanks for um, her presence, her teachings and uh, what we will learn from her tonight. So um, I'll get this to you Marge. Thanks for being with us. I would also like to pass it off to Yvonne and, uh, and uh, all the elders from Kenora. Hi, good evening, those... everybody. So um, I'm here with um, elders from the Treaty 3 territory. We have Tommy Kiesick. We're having supper, by the way, so it smells so delicious in here. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Elder Kathy Lindsay and our other elder, Margaret Hunter. So we're very um, thankful to be here this evening and um, looking forward to the presentation. I wanna say thank you and welcome to everybody. I have some sweet grass here that I'm making a little smudge with. And this presentation by Catherine, I know Catherine quite well. So I wanna say hello and and welcome to her on her presentation. I have been a part of the work that she's doing and it, it means a lot to me, the work that she's undertaken. As we talk about, uh, as she presents about the anomalies or the burial sites that have been found at the Brandon Residential School. There are two sites there. Really? And before we started the work there, there were four elder women we went over there and we prayed and smudged the area and uh, talked to uh, the spirits of those that who were returned back to mother earth at that location named and unnamed and we invited them to go on to the spirit world and to not be there but to make that journey, that sacred journey that we all must would make. And some were unacknowledged, they were hidden and secret and buried. So we did a lot of work there and that work is still ongoing and I honor the work that Catherine is doing. And uh, I've been looking forward to the continuation of her work, but with the pandemic, things have changed, but I'm very much interested in the work that she still does. So. 
I wanted to uh, acknowledge her and the work she's doing. So I'd like to pray and uh, acknowledge the, the spirits of the ones that who have, you know, been in that area and went on to this sacred site, sacred place from there. And I always like to uh, say my prayers to the creator God in my own language. And, you know, I, I do a lot of prayers in English too because I'm lay clergy for the Anglican church. But when I pray about certain things, I like to do it in my own language. Amen. Thank you. Thanks so much. So uh, Catherine is uh, pursuing a doctoral degree at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, in Burnaby, British Columbia. Uh, she's enrolled in an interdisciplinary program that allows her to work with faculty in the departments of Indigenous Studies and Archaeology and is affiliated with the Center for Forensic Research. Uh, current work stems from research started during her MA at the University of Manitoba, in part, done in partnership with Sioux Valley Dakota Nation, uh, focused on locating cemeteries at the Brandon Indian Residential School in Manitoba. And Darian is current, currently working on Bachelor of Arts with a major in Native Studies and minor in Anthropology at Brandon University. Originally from Manitoba, strong roots in Sioux Valley Garden Hill, uh, Darian is the community liaison for the Brandon Indian Residential School Cemetery Project. And this role helps facilitate respectful collaboration between Sioux Valley Dakota Nation and university partners. So uh, again, thank you so much. We're honored for you to be here. And um, good evening, everyone. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about our presentation, addressing the legacy of Brandon, the Brandon Residential School, exploring the role of community liaison. Um, myself and Catherine Nichols will be presenting. Um, the authors are Darian Kennedy, uh, Catherine Nichols, Alden Yellhorn, Emily Holland, John Albanese, uh, Deanna Redder, uh, Deong Young, uh, Kim Figuera, Dale Blackbird, and Hugo Cardioso. Um, we want to acknowledge the land that we uh, virtually we acknowledge all Indigenous peoples' traditional homelands in Canada specifically the land that we are currently situated on in modern day city, Brandon, Manitoba, which is the traditional homelands of the Anishinaabeg, uh, Cree, Oja Cree, Dakota, Métis, and Dene peoples. Um, we just wanted to um, let everyone know that uh, our talk is, a, it's an important talk, uh, but that it, we're gonna talk about cemeteries. Um, and we're going to talk about um, the students and there'll be photos and um, this might be triggering. So we just wanted to encourage you to, um, you know, if you need to turn off your video, if you need to leave, we, we understand, we support you. Um, as it was said before, uh, Marge is here for you to talk with in the chat, but we also wanted to let you know that um, the National um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they have a 24-hour line that you can call as well. Uh, so I just wanted to start out with sort of the, the larger um, uh, people that we're working with. Uh, we have Indigenous and non-Indigenous faculty members and we're really lucky because we're working with uh, Simon Fraser University, uh, Brandon University here, and Windsor University. And all these professors um, bring important skills uh, to this project um, and, and with great, uh, yeah, we're just really grateful to have their support. Um, there you go, Darian, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, so uh, uh, we would just like to introduce the students behind the project. So myself as a community li liaison, uh, Catherine Nichols, um, and Kim Fir Fir Gear, Fir Gear, 
and uh, Dale Blackbird. The current research team is comprised of both Simon Fraser University and Brandon University students. Really quickly, um, I just wanted to say that uh, I was born and raised in Brandon, and now I live and work here. And uh, I just, I show this picture here because um, uh, it's my very first archeology span excavation. And it was just a really important uh, moment in my life. Uh, a little bit about myself. I was born in Winnipeg. Um, I now live and work and go to school in Brandon. I am a member of Garden Hill First Nation in Northern Manitoba. Um, the, the how I came about to get the position was that um, I was uh, in one of uh, Dr. Holland's class and she's uh, one of the anthropologists that's working on this case. And that's how um, we got connected. And uh, I did know a fair bit of the background of the, 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 the school and um, the, the project itself, because I did uh, attend the community gatherings and uh, my grandpa was a counselor at the time. So, yeah. Um, personal connections. Uh, so again, personal connection to the Brandon Residential School. Um, when I was uh, four, just before my brother was born, um, it was, I believe it was in 1999, my mom went to, uh, went for a, a school field trip. And then it was to the Brandon Residential School. It was the rubble right before, uh, a couple of years before it was torn down in 2000. Um, I, afterwards, my mom went for that field trip. She took me and my, my stepdad up there and I really remember feeling something when I went there and remembering and my mom uh, looked at me so like, she's like, how do you know all this? And I was just like, well, I don't know, I just, I just know. And I remember having dreams about the, the, the Brandon Residential School and it wasn't like nightmares or anything. It was just, uh, it was just, this weird connection that I developed with uh, the, the land and um, the school itself. Um, I'll pass it over to Catherine. Uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting that you had such a, a unique experience. Um, for me, uh, I took the school bus past the residential school every day um, and I really didn't know what it was. It wasn't until the school was actually torn down in 2000 and it was my parents that took me up to the site. And um, I don't know, it was just sort of weird that I, I, that was when I realized it was a school for indigenous children. And I just thought that was really strange that there would be a separate school. And so that sort of spurred my curiosity and why I wanted to learn more about the school and, and about its history. Okay, so um, I just wanted to briefly give you some quick background about how I got started doing this work. Um, basically, quickly, um, I was introduced to, um, uh, like he would be considered an elder in the community, uh, but maybe just a, an important person to talk to about these uh, sensitive and cultural things. Um, because I realized that um, there was probably a cemetery associated with the Brand Residential School and I didn't know how to go about starting that work. And so it was really interesting because um, uh, I thought it would be sort of an intimidating and, and formal process, but really um, the, my community contact just said, you know, let's go to Starbucks and let's chat about this a little bit. Um, and so it was there that like, I took a formal letter to outline what I was thinking about and what to do with the research and how we might be able to um, find the cemetery and, and the boundaries of the cemetery. Um, but it was also a really important time to start talking about cultural concerns. Um, you know, how, how can you best proceed with this work without, um, without causing more harm? Um, so it was a really important and foundational meeting. Um, and I continue to think about it and I continue to think about the advice he's given me and as we move forward with this work. So uh, we're going to be talking about the, obviously the Indian residential schooling system in Canada, the 
dark secret or a sad chapter. Um, it's state funded and church uh, administered. Um, they forcibly remove children. Um, the, the residential schools were eight, uh, from 1828 to 1996 was the last one that closed down, but there was uh, a history before 1828 uh, for different schools. Uh, the specific uh, residential school that we're in question is obviously the Brown and Indian Residential School. It was uh, in operation from 1995 to 1972. Um, management was Methodist United and United Church. Um, education included agriculture, academic, um, student, and as it was used as a student residence. Um, the recruitment was uh, from uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and none of it. I'm just trying to remember what slides are mine. I think those ones are mine, Marion. <laughs> um, one unique thing about um, the Bryan Residential School was that it was strategically placed. Um, um, we have it on the outskirts of, of Brandon. And it's adjacent to what was called a Brandon Experimental Farm. Um, now it's called the Brand Research Center. Um, but this, this would play a unique role and an important role in uh, the work that the students would do at the school and how the school became sort of a landmark flagship uh, institution uh, that Brandon was very proud of uh, at, the, at the time. Um, and just one is like, I like showing these historical photos to give you an idea of what it would have looked like. Um, so the, the Brandon Research Center itself was established in 1886, and it was one of the five original experimental farms established in Canada. I, uh, I included these uh, pictures to show that um, the hard work that the, the children were doing um, it was strategically placed next to the agricultural center or vice versa um, to help um, for cheap labor for an extra hand with uh, agricultural training. And it, um, if you look at the bottom right picture, you can understand how hard the, the lives of the children were um, understanding that the children are probably about six or, or seven, eight years old, and they're young boys making, um, the men are making the young boys do men's work, right? And it's very hard training and, and it's just, it, uh, yeah. So. yeah. No, I, I appreciate Darian speaking to the oral history and the stories that were told about the, the ex, uh, extreme amount of work that students had to do. And it, it's unique in the sense that like for Brandon, I'll just speak quickly about the archival research because for Brandon, um, they had uh, purebred cattle and horses um, brought in from Ontario in 1915. So they're starting to sort of set the scene about the caliber of the school. Um, and it also brings in a lot of um, financial gain for the, for the school as they, they breed and sell purebred animals. And the picture on the, like on the top here with the cows in front of the bridge is a picture of the boys um, at the Brandon Winter Fair. Um, and it, it, the caption underneath the archives says, uh, you know, first prize car lot of cattle. So there's a lot going on in these photos. So that's why we try to show you um, sort of what's happening with the boys and the girls and the things that would have been done to keep the school going. Again, the um, experiences are very different than um, what have been uh, non-Indigenous students. As you can see here, there's a graduating class in 1947. They appear to be... Um, it's very staged, in, in my opinion. Um, with that being said, um, the different experiences va uh, varied from era to era and then also from a school to school. Um, Catherine, you wanted to talk more to the experiences or? Um, 
I think maybe I'll just say that when I started this work, when I spoke to people in the community, um, people often said that the Brandon Residential School wasn't that bad. You know, there were more notorious schools out there. And um, the more research I did, the more I found that not to be true. Um, and that um, this school is, is an example of all of the abuses that happen at the school. Um, for the majority of students. Um, so we could talk a lot about that, but we just wanted to um, highlight um, highlight the students um, because that's what's driving this project is how to honor them um, now. So um, so um, I guess uh, this is also sort of reiterating, we're trying to bring you back to the project and the work that we're doing. Um, how do you find a relational starting point? How do you start this kind of work? Um, and basically what happened was um, once uh, my community contact um, took the letter and, and, the, and the conversation that I had, had um, to chief and council, um, they agreed to meet with me, uh, to talk with me more about it. And um, it was interesting because, um, uh, you know, at these at these meetings uh, to discuss the project, I almost thought they would like give me a yes or no answer, and I, I thought it would just be very like, no, you're not indigenous, you can't do this work, or yes, go ahead and find the cemeteries, but instead, um, we had really important um, discussions, and I realized that there was more than just a cemetery search that was needed. Um, so in talking with chief and council, I realized that we needed to add an archival aspect. Um, I wasn't just gonna go into the archives and look for the names of children that had passed away at the school. Um, I was also gonna look for photographs um, because I wanted to, chief and council wanted to have a, uh, a learning center of some sort and have the photos of the students displayed so that um, you know, if elders or survivors came to the school, they could start to identify these children in these photos um, and give meaning back uh, to the land and to the students. Another thing that we did was we added a search site. Um, and I thought we would just look for the one cemetery. Um, but the reality is that there was a lot more going on. And um, basically um, we looked behind the school um, there was concerns from survivors and from elders that uh, there was depressions um, behind the school. And so, um, yeah, we just added another search site. And then another thing that we added was um, interviews with survivors. And I didn't do very many. I only spoke with survivors who wanted to share their story, who were ready to share their story. Um, but important things came out of those meetings um, and conversations because um, what I learned was that um, students that were doing laundry um, had to take the, the clothing and the bedding out to the back of the school to hang on the lines and that they weren't allowed to go in certain places of the property because the teachers told them there were unmarked graves there. And so this really did help support and narrow uh, the field work that we ended up doing in 2012 and 13. Um, so basically all I wanted to say was that um, the research design, the plan and carrying it all out um, was done collaboratively. Um, and it, it definitely shaped and expanded the initial project that I wanted to do. Uh, but I think that the extra time and effort was um, was worth it to make the work uh, meaningful uh, for Sioux Valley Dakota Nation. Um, I can't remember. Darian, do you want me to talk to this one? Uh, just we wanted to show. Just kind yeah. of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is this is. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, we just want, we just had a map to give you an idea of like what places we're talking about. So we have the school highlighted in red. Um, when we have like the Grand Valley Road, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, over here is where Walmart is and Home Depot. Um, so if you're coming down the North Hill and um, 
the first school cemetery is located near the Assiniboine River. The second school cemetery is located north and it's on um, uh, Brandon Research Center property now. And then the third section, the third site that we looked at is just north and east of the school. So just to sort of give you a visual of where we're talking about. Are you okay if I keep talking, Darian? Yeah, it's, I'm totally okay if you. Jump in whenever you want. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna to focus today's talk on the second school cemetery because that's where I had access to when I was doing my master's uh, thesis research. Um, and I was given permission by Agriculture Canada um, to go onto their site and to um, do non-invasive work. Everyone didn't want me to do any excavation, it was just non-invasive. Um, and before we even got started, uh, my community contact from Sioux Valley to Coronation came out and he did a smudge with us and in the field team. And that was really important. And we also did a, a smudge at the end of the field work. Um, and then when we were at that site, um, we started talking about where the, the unmarked graves might be inside the cemetery fence. I mean, you can see it's really overgrown um, and it was really hard to tell. Um, but we actually, we started talking about maybe the fence wasn't where the fence was meant to be. Maybe it was supposed to be out further because there were um, depressions outside the cemetery fence. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show you the non-invasive search methods that I used. Um, it, it ranged, uh, we used very um, cost-effective uh, search probes and we're just looking for soil compaction and different vegetation. We used uh, ground penetrating radar. It uses radio waves to detect anomalies. So if you're, um, your soil stratigraphy is disturbed, it should be able to pick up um, that disturbance. And we also use EM38, which uses electromagnetic ground conductivity um, to do sort of the same things as to detect any changes in the soil. And then finally, we um, used an unmanned aerial vehicle. Do not call it a drone. The RCMP does not like that. <laughs> but anyways, and we, we are able to take it up. Um, and take some um, photos of the residential school cemetery. Um, so this, this I just want to kind of show you this photo. Um, the photo is not, um, it's only showing one foot um, for the ground penetrating radar data. So it's not going very deep at all. Um, but I just wanted to show you that because there was concerns that the there might be unmarked graves outside the cemetery fence. We were able to do non-invasive surveys. Um, like right here highlighted in red is the cemetery uh, fence. And we did the same sort of size of cemetery just all the way around to see if we could find any anomalies and to see if we should be extending the fence. Um, and we also looked behind here, but what you're seeing is a lot of tree roots and that really affected the, the GPR reading. Um, and I just, I show this just to give you an idea of um, what, is it, what the 3D data looks like. And, um, and, it, and basically what we will see is uh, we'll start seeing these red hot spots and things like that that show a, a disturbance in the soil. Um, so I just wanted to quickly give a quick summary. Um, you know, when we went to the school cemetery, the Karen, um, had a date on it. It said 1929 to 57. But when I do did my archival research, it's probable that the cemetery opened much sooner, as early as 1912. Um, so that that makes a big difference in the cemetery's operation uh, time period. Um, and if we consider those dates, um, while the Karen in the cemetery says there's only 11. Uh, students who passed away and they're buried there. Um, the archives actually shows that there's more, uh, there's about 24 names of people that have that died at the school during that time period and they're likely buried there. And so for the burials, when we went there, there was 12 um, wooden crosses. There were white wooden crosses. Uh, but with the ground penetrating radar and the EM38 data, 
it's more likely that there's in between 18 and 24 um, graves at this site. So just in doing this work, um, we're, we're affirming and we're validating uh, survivor and community concerns. Um, yeah. Darian, did you wanna talk about this slide? Uh, so the total names from the archival records uh, state 75 names. Uh, spanning over 15 Indigenous communities in Manitoba. Um, second School Cemetery Forensic Survey, 12 marked graves and 14 unmarked graves. And that's the result of the, invest the initial investigation there. Um, okay, sorry. sorry, are ahead. you ready? Yeah. And uh, so when doing these, uh, this whole project, uh, we have to keep in mind that we have to be flexible be patient, be available, be realistic, be realistic. Um, we want we want to honor both non-indigenous and indigenous science and understand that oral history collaborate like collaboratively with um, kind of Western academia uh, used together can we can uh, confirm both uh, both sides using the different ways of, of knowing, which are indigenous uh, in the facts of like um, oral history, um, different sciences are stuff like that. Um, number seven is be mindful and be an advocate for um, uh, the, the project itself, um, for indi the, the indigenous children that we're um, fighting to, to be found and um, yeah. Um, so this is my slide. <laughs> um, basically, I just wanted to say that um, I was really honored to uh, be invited and come talk at one of the uh, annual survivor gatherings that Sioux Valley hosts. Um, it's on the Brandon Residential School property. Um, and it's a really important opportunity for me to um, to present what we've done, but also to, to listen to community members and their concerns and get, and get guidance on the way to go forward. Um, yeah. Anything else you want to add to that, Darian? Uh, it's just funny how, uh, pardon me, little things align because at these gatherings, um, it was also um, how uh, Catherine and I connected for the first time and it was uh, somebody locked their keys in the car and Catherine was ready to call CA and I was like no I can I can open it with a, a coat hanger or something and, <laughs> and then we crossed paths like that and um, about three three years or so later um, we got connected on the the project itself and so um, I think I I was meant to be on the, the project and help work uh, with Catherine to um, kind of uh, um, work through reconciliation in a way that um, in a way that I can in a in a capacity that I am able to. So I'm really thankful for the survivor gathering. Um, I'm not. I was really intrigued by the the talk that day and that's how i uh come to know um a lot of the background before i uh before i joined the the project in uh in a capacity i guess so moving forward um from when the project started um we had uh, they hired me in 2020 and then with COVID and stuff, um, we had to kind of put the, the, the um, archaeological dig on hold. Um, with that being said, we needed a committee of elders to help us guide the, the project in a respectful way. Um, again, um, 
the COVID kind of put um, kind of a, a temporary pause, but I'm optimistic that we can, as soon as we can um, get, uh, have gatherings and uh, per, uh, we can pursue another couple meetings, but we had our first meeting in September, I believe, or was it August? I believe it it was, it was technically August, but we had another one in September before. Okay. It was the red zone. <laughs> yeah. In, um, pardon me, in August. And those meetings with uh, the community of elders is uh, the, one of the examples of um, community collaboration with the project and how uh, Catherine is putting the respect of the cultural um, influence ahead of the project itself. And... Uh, I'm very honored to be working with her on with that and to be uh, an advocate for the project and to um, continue collaborating with Sioux Valley. And again, I'm just being super optimistic uh, that uh, as soon as um, these, uh, these limitations are lifted, we can get back on track. Were you going to talk to the slide, Darian? Yeah, I can again, sorry. Uh, okay. So again, the future of the project, continued collaboration with the project partners. I, as soon as it's lifted, I wanna start seeing bi-weekly commu uh, committee mem meetings, um, further archival research. Um, something I forgot to add was the, um, the survivor um, interviews. And um, I just wanted to note again, the project is structured to allow flexibility and collaboration with Sioux Valley and other Indigenous nations, um, just reiterating the collaborative uh, research design. Uh, we advocate for Indigenous families and communities. Um, we wish to uh, formally protect these uh, cemetery sites, unarmed, um, pardon me, honor unmarked graves. Uh, we want to help uh, relatives find their deceased loved ones. Um, with that being said, we have to be realistic and um, understand that it may not be within the cultural parameters of the traditions of Dakota or the other Indigenous groups that, they're, uh, that are affected. Um, with that being said, that's what gives me motivation to and motivation, pardon me, motivation and the interest to um, work further with this project and to uh, hopefully one day we can um, mark those. Um, one thing I just wanted to add about this photo um, was actually at a survivor gathering. So, um, uh, and they're the Unity Riders. And it was just really powerful. Um, the, the photo doesn't capture what was going on, um, but the unit riders came up to the residential school site um, and they, they just, the horses went around the site three times with the drums going. And it was just such a transformation. Um, and I know that Sioux Valley is working very hard to change this place from a place of pain to a place of healing. Um, so I just wanted to speak to that photo. Um, because there's, there's a lot going on in that photo um, that um, I think is worth, uh, worth talking about. Um, I think Darian might have left for a second. Um, so I'm, I might just close. Um, we just wanted to have a bunch of people to thank. Um, sorry, Darian's just sending me, a, he joined back. Darian, do you wanna close then? I don't know where he is. Okay. Anyways. I don't see um, him yet. These are, okay. Um, anyways, all of these people made this work possible and I just wanted to acknowledge all of them um, and, and just making this work possible. It wouldn't have been like, yeah, it just wouldn't have been possible without everybody. So thank you very much. Um, I think right now we wanted to open it up for questions and discussion, um, but also we'd be really happy just to hear about uh, people's personal connection to the Brown Residential Sky site. Um, 
things that uh, that they remember about the Brandon Residential School or um, questions that they had for us. Either, either way, we'd be happy with what anybody would like to share. So thanks. Darian, you're back. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I got a phone call on my cell phone. And it when I put end, it, yeah, so sorry. Yeah, so okay. I just wanted to apologize. Uh, we wanted to open up the questions and discussion. And also, if you're wanting to share, this is um, a safe space. And also, I don't feel obligated to. I can stop sharing my screen, okay? Sure, yeah. That, well, I'll, I'll first start by adding my thanks to both of you for sharing what you've done, what you have shared. And it, it's clear, clear that you've taken a lot of intentionality to the work that you're doing. Um, so thank you for that. There's uh, just a few questions that are beginning to come in the chat um, and I'll, I'll just read those. And if there's, uh, others have additional questions, please type them in there um, or if, uh, doesn't feel like you can do it typing it, then you can let me know that way as well. Um, but the first one is, um, were, there, were there accurate records that were records that match the sites found? Where were they? I'm curious about the other two sites as well. Yeah, okay, so um, talking about archives, it was particularly difficult to track those down and it was difficult to track down for certain years. Um, one of the really good records um, is called the quarterly returns. So they're taking track of attendance, but during those records, they also mention if children go to hospital or if they pass away. And we only have 16 years of those records. And I, the school operated for over 70 years. So it just doesn't give us a, a full enough snapshot of what's going on. Um, so that's why when Darian and I say, you know, we have 75 names, we knowingly admit that this is just a working list and that um, we might not, we might be missing uh, families and, and the, their, their children. So it's a very good question. And I wish I had more archive access to records. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, another question. Do you know the identities of the people who died there? And do you think other IRS may also have unmarked graves? It's a good question. Um, so we do have, we have names of, of students. Um, and in some cases we have home communities. So we know where they came from. Um, sometimes the way that the principals reported um, student attendance and student deaths was just with numbers. And it's interesting because the number of reported deaths per year does not match the recorded names of deaths per year. Um, so that's also an, an issue. Um, with regards to the broader issue of like Canada, residential schools and cemeteries. Um, yeah, yeah, I think quite a few will have them. Um, in the TRC's final report, um, they said that um, if a school opened before 1950, it's very likely that they would have a cemetery associated with the school. So I think that's, if, you, if we think about the 139 that are federally recognized, I think that leaves about 90 to 95 schools that likely have cemeteries. They give you an idea of what it is on a national scale. Thanks. Um, do you know if some students, uh, did some students go to the school in the city of Brandon? Oh, okay. That's a great question, which I don't have very much archival records, but just speaking with uh, uh, friends and family and uh, their friends, um, people remember having residential school students in their schools. So I, I think it was part of this transition where the residential school functioned more as a residence in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And um, students were, were uh, schooled in the public, like the Brandon public uh, schools. Um, but I mean, survivors would probably know that way more accurately than I do. Um. 
Thanks. Yeah. Um, for the records that you do have, were there causes of death listed at all? Do you know? Yeah. Yeah. We sometimes there's causes of death. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into it, but sometimes we do know why they they passed away. Um, May I please uh, include that uh, or add that? Um, not all of the grave sites were uh, children that attended the school. There's a couple from the, um, the mental health uh, hospital down the road. And there's uh, some records that indicate that there was actually uh, adults that were buried there that were from the sanatorium for the TB sanatoriums. Just seeing what other is here. What is happening... Um, so is it what is happening with the graves across the road from the residential school? Anything happening with that? No, oh, that's a very good question. Um, so I think it was, I want to say it was 2018. We actually uh, got permission to do a, a non-invasive survey. Um, and we were able to find the cemetery and delineate the boundaries. And so it's uh, working with the landowner to fence that area off. Um, and then hopefully work with um, the northern nations that the children are involved with um, to find a way that they want to commemorate that place. Um, so that's an ongoing, an ongoing project that kind of, because of COVID, um, hasn't been picked up yet but hopefully we can do that again soon yeah. um i wanted to add that there is concrete proof that there was a cemetery across and that was the ori uh, first original cemetery um presently it is a campground um i i can talk more to it i i just uh it's, I just feel so disgusted by the, the actions of um, both Brandon, um, the city of Brandon, because their hands aren't clean in that um, land transfer. Um, there's uh, maps indicating the, the Indian cemetery that was there beforehand. And I don't know, Catherine, you can talk probably more to it if you like, yeah. Um. I was just thinking of like the the land transfers itself. It, it's almost a legacy of like uh, slowly erasing the history of the school. With each map, the cemetery that's clearly labeled a cemetery uh, slowly becomes a memorial garden, mm -hmm. and so that um, becomes questionable then for landowners. Oh, do I actually have a cemetery here, or is this just a place where a, a cairn with a monument was placed? Mm -hmm. um, and so. And then with further passing of time, um, all of these landmarks are erased, you know, it flooded, but also people's memory, the community memory is lost. Um, so as part of that process of remembering and honoring this, the, these schools and these sites. Mm. Thanks, Thanks Catherine. Um, building on what you just said, is there a vision for what kind of markers or remembrance would be put in those sites? And can the sites be visited as well is another question. Do you want to talk to that, Darian, at all? Um, like maybe I, I, could, I could talk about site access because um, that's been an issue. Um, for sure, it was a problem with the, the first um, school cemetery that was by the Assiniboine River because it's a private campground. Um, as well with the Agriculture Canada, um, when they owned it, um, they had cattle on the on the property, and so it was it was protected, like it was locked, but almost to keep the public safe um, in that sense. But it was a real barrier for people who wanted to go through and do ceremony and to visit these sites, and 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 so um, right now the land is being leased to Sioux Valley Dakota Nation. And so I believe that if you were to ask chief and council, you could get access, but it, there are a few gates um, and you have to drive through to the site on a dirt road. Um, so, yeah. And that's, 
that's really been a, uh, a problem because of the different land ownership and jurisdiction and how um, for like, uh, you would have to ask different people for different visitation. But with that being said, um, we, we don't want that, you know what I mean? Like we want to be able to honor the students any way that we, we can and doing ceremony is an essential part of that. Yeah. 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 And then to speak to the part where you asked about um, what sort of um, like memorials will be put up. Um, I think that's like too soon for us to talk about, but in the sense that like, like very much on the front of our minds is that working with Sioux Valley Dakota elders and, and doing this outreach soon for um, other communities that were affected. Um, I really hope that they, they guide us in what they, what they need, what they want, and um, how they see, um, how say they see memorialization um, mm -hmm. for, the, for their children. Mm, excellent, yeah, thanks. Um, another question is asking, when did the shifting of the, label, shifting of the labeling of the site happen? Do you know what that's referring to? Yeah. I'm not, I am for the cemeteries, do you think? Is that what that's? Um, I think so, but Julie, if you wanna uh, clarify that, you can. Or you can unmute if you want. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's what I meant. I was wondering about that when you said that the, I gathered that the city was changing how the site was labeled and I wondered what the, uh, what the time period was uh, when that was happening, when that began. Yeah, so I don't have specifics. I just know that in 1980, um, there's a, a plan of the site and it clearly labels the cemetery as a cemetery. And then somewhere in that transition, um, there's these public maps of, this, of the site from the city um, and, it, and it gets changed to a memorial site. And those maps don't have dates on when they were created. Um, but I think they were circulated around the 2000s, um, but I can't say for certain. Um, There's pictures from the early 2000s that um, before the flood, there was uh, very clearly a uh, gate, uh, pardon me, uh, a fence area where um, they were having uh, some sort of ceremony or um, uh, memorial type uh, event. And you can clearly see that it is blocked off and then the following year it doesn't appear to be anything there and the the uh, fast forward to 2018 um there's actually where the the maps indicate there's actually um a camper trailer on it when they went to go uh, take pictures and do the very minimal uh, non-invasive uh research that they they did there that day um there was structures and different uh, stuff that wasn't supposed to be there. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Um, so a question that comes in, which you can uh, share about your thoughts on this. So were these cemeteries, were they hidden in such a way to hide the truth about the numbers of children that, pa that, were, that passed away there and hide what was going on in the school? Was that evident? Um, so if I think about it from like a system perspective, um, I, I, the government just didn't create policies or provide the financial, um, support to keep these cemeteries, um, running proper. Like I, I have a letter from the principal asking for money to have a fence and to, um, get headstones and then the department just simply says no that's on you if you want to do it the school has to pay for it um, so most of the time uh, that is sort of how it worked is was it, it wasn't the department's responsibility it was the individual school's responsibility and then thinking about it now um, there was no government policies to transfer any sort of perpetual care for these these cemeteries um, so there's nothing in place that once, you know, once the residential school shut down and the land starts being parceled off and sold off, um, there was no mechanism in place 
to have formal provincial registration of cemeteries or formal municipal um, protections and things like that. And, and so that is a big part from a legis like a thinking about it from a, the way that the system works. Um, but Darian, do you want to talk about uh, things about um, so like like <laughs> yeah like now um, they definitely didn't make it easy. So it would be evident that they were definitely trying to hide something. Um, for example, uh, the records are housed in Ottawa um, for the the different schools for the Indian agents. Um, a lot of records were kind of um, they were insignificant, right? Like they weren't. There wasn't a whole lot of information. Um, yeah, like <laughs> they definitely didn't make it easy. Like our our the archival stuff is like the the notes and the all the all the files that Catherine goes through. It's not easy work. No, and I mean, like, if I think about it a little bit more in the forensic context and not just the records, um, the fact that survivors told me that they knew when they were students in the 60s that there were unmarked graves on the school, it, it lends your, your thoughts to think, why? Why was that allowed then? And what, what was going on that would make that happen? Anyways, sorry, I didn't say that very eloquently, but yeah. And understanding that the first cemetery is non-existent now, it's definitely um, evident of something that is trying to be kind of erased from history, yeah, or forgotten. And that's what why we do the work that we do, is to that we're fighting for the children that don't have a voice and that are still there, you know, that never got to go home. Yeah, thanks for that. It's definitely complex and also shows how important this research is. Um, so thank you for that. Um, a couple other questions that came around. Um, one was about, has there been requests for repatriation of remains to home communities? And also how is how Sioux Valley First Nations using the land now? Um, so requests for repatriation, that is a deep question. Um, and I can say even before I started this work, um, when I got going, I reached out to the United Church and I worked with Diane Hagland, who used to be the archivist in uh, Winnipeg at the University of Winnipeg. And um, she was great help and a wealth of information. And she was involved in an instance where a family from a Northern community wanted to bring their child home and they went out to the cemetery site and none of the cemetery plots are labeled. And so they didn't know which grave was their child. So they couldn't do anything. And that was, that was before like DNA really got going and stuff like that now. Um, so with, with all the science and technology, it's sort of why I wanted to have all of these uh, professors and universities on our team because we have DNA and isotope specialists that can hopefully help us if, if it comes to the point where families do want their children brought home. Yeah. Um, there was another part to that question about how the site's being used right now. Um, I don't know if I'm the right person to speak to it um, about what's going on right now. I know that they're, they're in the process of of working on turning it into a healing center, I think, but uh, maybe, I don't know, I'm looking at Marge. Marge, you might have a better idea of what's going on. <laughs> um, anyways, if someone else wanted Marge, to- Come yeah. back next week or in two weeks, but next week, because Marge will be talking to us about the plans for the site um, right. and Sioux Valley's intentions around that. Oh, good. So that we have a whole session on that. So that's great. Thank you. That leads nicely. Yeah. Um, Elder Tommy Kizik from uh, Kenora wanted to uh, share some comments. So I'll open up to him. Oops. Go ahead, Gab. Bonjour. Can you hear him? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. 
I don't really know how to begin this, but it's far from over. My parents both went to residential school in Macintosh. Their parents, my grandparents, took them out because of the treatment. A lot of these people were said that good things would happen to the children. And many of the children not knowing that it was their last time getting out of school, getting out of their home, never to return. A lot of these children, as we heard, were beaten to death, ran away from school. They never made it once. They either froze or drowned or run over by the train. And something has to be done. I mean, it's far from being over. These were children and these were servants of God. Why did they allow these kind of things to happen? I myself had my back broken. I'm 76 years old now, and I am still angry by, because of what happened to me. It's pretty hard for me to talk about it, and even nowadays as, as I, I try to speak to you. I met a lot of people in Winnipeg when they had this uh, all gatherings of elders. I was really happy to see mm. a lot of them. Thank you. It's far from being over. I believe that all the Anishinaabe should bring their beliefs and we should start talking about what can we do about these kind of things. We were told never to disturb people that have passed on. The reserves I'm talking about, the graveyards I'm talking about, the hydro came there and ran over countless of graves just to put the line through. Again, that, that is inhuman. How many goods? I wish I had more time. I, I got lots to say. <laughs> I, want, I want to hear some of your stories, which is, you know, similar to ours. So it, as if it was been planted. We guys get into them. We also have a uh, Bujo, uh, uh, Kathy Lindsay. Uh, we also have a burial site here. It's a pauper's um, uh, burial site. And um, it's uh, mostly made up of unmarked graves uh, of all ages, uh, residential stu school students uh, I, of all ages. Um, and they, it is situated between a dirt road uh, and the railway uh, tracks. Uh, we were told um, many years ago that we were not to touch or disturb uh, any anyone that's in within that cemetery. One person that's in that cemetery is my mom. And every year I try to, I visit the, the cemetery, I offer tobacco, I sing, I uh, say prayers and I also sing songs, but we still are not allowed uh, right going in into, into the, cem the, the cemetery itself. And to see it, I can tell you right now that you would be shedding tears or you would be uh, very emotional in regards to anger, sadness, all those. Um, and I am every time I go there and uh, knowing that we cannot uh, disturb anybody and I understand that we have to respect, we have to respect our loved ones that have passed on, but knowing that their spirits and that their grave sites have meshed, have fallen in, 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 because it's swamp land, have fallen and uh, meshed into one another, that couldn't be any more disturbing and sad in regards to our people. Which... Thank you for sharing that. Um, just wondering if anybody else um, wanted to share something at this time. Mm -hmm. Feel free to, if there is someone that has something you'd like to share, feel free to unmute. Uh, I have an experience I can share with you. Um, I'm on, on seated uh, Anishinaabe territory in um, 
one of my elder in Chapleau, Ontario. There's a, there was a school also there. Um, they found the cemetery um, because the ministry want to retrieve trees. And the cemetery is on the other side of the street or where the school was. And um, some of the elders, there's two communities there, the Cree and Ojibwe. And they, they went to my elder and said, we have to do something. They're, they're gonna remove the trees. And we know that our brothers or sisters are there. So uh, she found, she went, she fought with them. It was a big argument. And uh, she literally went on the site and stopped the men working with the machines because the wishing the machines were digging. And it turns out that, yes, there were a lot of little children there of all ages. There was about 15 graves with many bodies in each graves. Um, a river going down there, apparently it, with some years, it really dig out some of those graves. So they think that they lost many of some of the children that were buried there, but um, it was quite very, very hard to go and, and be there. When I entered, um, yeah, I was overwhelmed. My husband, we were all crying and the energy there. Uh, grandmothers, the some some of the grandmothers, they go every year, they do ceremonies. And there's one grave that they really were able to know the name. Um, that was the last child that was buried there. And what, what, what I found that was very hard is that we, talking with elders, we found out that some girls were buried there with babies, mm. their own babies. Uh, so that was very traumatizing. Mm. Um, so with the ministry and everything, they gathered the ministry were like, oh my God, it's true. And like, because they still wanted to deny that it was there. Um, many elders came up and then they said, I know my brother and my sister is there. Their name was such and such. So they were able to give, put some names in and little graves. Uh, someone bought a, brought a canoe there to honor the children. But finally, it turns out that there's more than 60 children there. And um, now there's a fence around it. And like, they don't like people to go in um, just to go and, you know, sneak and peek. It's nothing for that. But uh, if you want to go there and pray, um, they let people go in, especially family but uh all the two uh groups of uh nations they decide to leave it there and it's beautiful because the trees had grown up so it, it, it was never never declared as a real cemetery for the school it was always a hidden area so now it was declared as a cemetery so um mm. it's quite overwhelming and mm. to, to know that in every of those schools there's cemeteries like that it's very very heartbreaking it's, yeah very sad so yeah. yeah so i like to go in and, and pray when i go there and think of those children mm. it's uh the east to the west see it's the same it's mm. that it's very sad mm. that's all <laughs> i want to share mm. thank you Thank you, Carol. Um, if there are any other quick questions, feel free to put them in. Um, oh, so there's one more that came from Elder Kathy, who just shared with us just a minute ago. He, she asked, how do you cope throughout this project, physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally? For yourself, I think Catherine and Darian as well. That's a good question. Um, I don't know how I cope. Um, maybe it's part of like uh, the academic training. Um, we're supposed to be a forensic anthropologist. You're supposed to be, um, you know, objective, which is a terrible word, but that sort of training and like emotionally distancing yourself is part of the training. 
Um, but the more you do this work, the more you realize that um, it just needs so much compassion. It just needs so much. Um, it just needs the energy that I can give it. So that's what we try to do. And like Darian and I, I don't know, maybe I'm saying too much, but we've had good days and bad days. Uh, you know, we'll leave elder meetings and we'll just be so excited. Um, but then there's other days when you're just like, oh man, there's so much more work to do. So uh, I, I guess maybe it's just COVID too. Everyone sort of feels like that during this time. Um, but uh, it's been good. Like I do like uh, when I'm invited for ceremonies um, and Darian and I have gone to the residential school and done a smudge. So that was really good too. Um, do you want to speak to anything, Darian? Um, for myself, like, it's just at the back of my mind that um, there's so much work to be done. Um, that's what keeps me going. Um, I'm really um, thankful for the opportunity to um, be a part of this project because it aligns with a lot of how I can help um, reconciliation in my own capacity, like, like, like I said before, um, I have a background, my minor is anthropology, so I have um, a bit of uh, training and a couple uh, courses with um, different anthropologists and I think um, if we're speaking candidly um, there is those bad days where, where I am overwhelmed with sadness. And one of those days was when I went up there with Catherine and we, we examined some of, she showed me some of the, 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 the depressions and you just got to wonder is like, what happened here? What, what, what does the land have to, have to, to tell us? And there's a story behind it and to believe the stories of the survivors and that they're not survivors, they're um, real experiences. And just understanding that we're in a position to honor and respectfully guide the, the project to kind of, um, to read into how things happened and to get the truth. And that's what we're, we're after is the truth that isn't told and the truth that isn't, it, it, that's forgotten. And a lot of this research um, kind of opens the door to finding out what what's in store. Yeah, and maybe I could like end it on a positive note. Um, and like, I know Darian and I have said collaboration like every other word, um, but it really, it just means that we're not doing this work in isolation. And then we're like, as a team, um, like, even um, Kim Figura she helped us uh, make this presentation. So we just, we all have these different skills and we're all working to the same goal and we're able to help each other in the ways that we can. Um, so, yeah, and I, I know that like we, we mentioned like our university partners, but we have um, worked with the United Church here locally too. And it's been a very good experience. So yeah, it's just really good when everyone can mobilize and get behind like, Hey, we're looking for missing children and people are like how can i help so it's always encouraging so just the thanks for to the community in general yeah thanks thanks catherine uh, and both of you for those thoughts i actually was just going to follow up on that what you just said I'm, i was curious about the um the church parties that you mentioned who ran the, these two schools and whether they have engaged at all whether you anticipate engaging with them and what do you anticipate that would look like um, obviously, this is a church organizations here, the many churches represented tonight, but specifically those. Right. Um, so um, I don't even know where to start this story. Uh, but essentially, we worked a lot with um, uh, Craig Miller at Knox United Church, and we also worked with Barb Jardine. Um, and together, uh, we had this idea that we wanted to do a traveling photo exhibit and it was through their efforts um, yeah, applying for grants and things like that and working in partnership with Sioux Valley to select the photos and things like that that you know all this awareness is starting to come around um, and so I'm, I'm very grateful that um, 
United Church has been really helpful. And um, if I ever finish my PhD, um, I can start being more active and do more, more of these, these projects that we need to get going. So yeah, yeah. anyways. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Yeah. There are, go ahead, Gary. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Yeah, um, I'm Robert living in Winnipeg. I just wanted to put this in a little bit larger context. Um, <clears throat> speaking for people whose ancestors came from another place and are buried elsewhere, but find ourselves living here. Um, I, I'm very grateful for this work that you're doing very grateful the stories. I mean, these are very painful stories. They're sad stories. Um, but because, because of the, the, the strength of the heart in, in the stories, the strength of the spirit in the stories, for me, connect us who have come from away, connect us to the people who have always been here. And equally importantly, or perhaps even more importantly, connect us to the land. So where, where any person, where any, especially any child, is interred in the earth, that, that land is sacred. And it can remind us that, that all the land is sacred. And it helps us to realize that wherever we go here, and <laughs> nice to see our, my friends in, in Kenora, Tommy and, <clears throat> and, and Kathy, because I went to that cemetery. But I was also where I taught and I spoke in a school once, it's four, uh, grade four is in Kenora, and said, you know, you have your names for the bays and and places around here, but every place that you walk around here, and that's the same wherever we go, every place has been named by the people who were here before. Um, the, the, people's, the people have imprinted themselves on this land for generations and for thousands of years. And for me, that's very helpful. It helps, it helps me connect with, with the, the need to, to honor the spirit in the land, <clears throat> to honor the spirit of the people who protected this land and who welcomed us from away to, to, to live here uh, with them. And that's important for me. It's important for us as outsiders, I think, to, to, to be motivated to join with uh, indigenous people who were here before to join with them in this honoring and in, the, in protecting the land which is sacred. So, so thank you very much for all of you who have shared these stories. It's mm -hmm. very important work. <clears throat> and it's, I just want to say, of course, it's for the families. Of course, it's for the indigenous people, but it is, it is work that's for all of us. It's important for all of us. <clears throat> so thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, and we're nearing the end of the time, um, but it was uh, suggested, and I think it's a really nice idea that we um, take just a few minutes, just a minute to in, be in silence as we remember uh, those whose lives were passed. So if we would, people would be willing to do that, that would be wonderful. And then I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Bree after that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, for all of this and for all of your work and, and for the care um that you put into your work in this presentation and engagement and uh it's really meaningful so thank you so much um yeah it's hard to transition for sure um yeah we appreciate everyone who's come today we already talked a little bit about next week's uh session uh with elder marge about uh indigenous youth suicides and future plans for a uh, healing center so we are uh, grateful and thankful and honored um, to have her share next week. These are such important, all of these are so important. Um, so we do welcome everyone to um, come back. It's the same Zoom link that you had this time, um, same time. So next Thursday at 6.30, um, we would love to see um, as many here as possible for that. And yeah, I invite, uh, Marge to, to give us a, a closing and a, a blessing if you're, if that's okay. Um, I think it's, yeah, it feels really important to end on that note for sure. Yes, I just wanted to um, share some comments. You know, this is a, a hard topic 
And I really appreciate the work that the Karen and Darian and the group that are working together to try and bring some comfort and uh, to, to those families of the students who attended residential school, for those who were lost, to those who don't know where their families, members are buried. And uh, it's a tragedy, really. And I'm thankful they were able to share and bring a little bit of knowing about what happened in these schools to people in this presentation audience. Uh, I thank them for their compassion. And I think they get a lot of um, energy from the work they do in a helping manner so that it does not uh, I wouldn't know if that would bother would be the, the right word but it does not sadden them as much as other people who hear or know of this uh, dark spot in Canada's history regarding residential schools but uh, they have a youthful energy and I think they rely on that to go forward and you know we prayed for them, blessed uh, Catherine and the work that she does, that she would be able to go forward and do the things that she has to do to help our people and the students that were in those schools. So she walks with a lot of blessings from our gatherings that we had. We used to have every year in Brandon. And Darian, now that I know he's involved in this project, he certainly will be in my prayers also, and those who are part of it. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. However, it turns out best for everybody. But in the spirit of reconciliation, I think many more people are willing to offer assistance in the work that's being done. And I certainly appreciate that. I know I've worked with... Uh, Craig, Reverend Craig Miller from uh, Knox United Church in Brandon. They do a presentation about the school. They have a traveling uh, exhibition on photos and stories. And they've uh, brought a lot of knowledge into the area because even people who lived in Brandon swore that they did not know there was a residential school right there in Grand Valley. So I appreciate all the work that's been done to get this message out to people about what happened in the past, what's being done to help our people now to go forward in a good way and to take care of those graves that are there. And I appreciate uh, Robert, I believe it was, that spoke about uh, the earth being sacred. It certainly is. We come from the earth and we return to the earth. And we know that that's a blessing when Chimaka, her grandmother or Mother Earth receives them back into herself. And it's a journey that's made by each spirit to return to that sacred place that's been created for us that many people know as heaven. And no matter what's happened, we have that comfort that they're with Creator God. And uh, we cert I certainly appreciate the work that's being done. And I... Uh, Wanted to uh, let everybody know that it's uh, good that you took part and uh, you know what has happened. You have a bit of knowledge to go forward now. And I'd like to ask for a blessing in my language before we close. Un <laughs> Which I was
ماه چلوشی چه های چیچه حتی آکان تا کنشون خیلی باشی که جوان یک با همه چین چه هاشو کنم که چه هم کن ما از کور بلسنگ تنایت لورد آن ایچ نروان در از اپار دیس پریزنتیشن گیو هم پیس گیو هم بلسنگ در مایم They will not be in sorrow, but they will remember that all souls go to heaven. And that the work here will continue to a good end, Lord. You bless each and every one that is working together to bring about something good out of this. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Miigwech. Miigwech. Have a good evening, everybody.